Okay, if you guys will stand with me for our scripture reading for the day. I forgot to put it on my phone, sorry. The word of God speaks to us like this from Matthew 6 today. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is the very word of God for us today. Yes. Uh, like I said earlier, we are a brand new church and we're in this phase. Like, I, I think it's important that we all know what phase we're in. Because it's, it's easy, especially if this is your first week here or one of your first few weeks, maybe a friend invited you. To kind of look at what's going on and we're like, well, where really, really are we? There's no, things are confusing. It's a little difficult. Um, we're in a phase of like, here, here's what you should think of. When you build a house, it doesn't look like a house when you start building it. You start tilling the ground and then you're going to pour the foundation and then you're going to throw up framework and all that. And you kind of do it piece by piece. And, and that's where we are, right? So we're we're coming out of this, this phase where we were doing core team development and just kind of talking about what we believe and, and what that's going to look like. And uh, we're also at this point, uh, there's a group of, of uh, existing and potential leaders that I'm spending a lot of time developing because the church is more than a building or an event. So like if this, if Sunday is all that you experience of Frontline, that, that's great. You're welcome here. Um, but but frontline is more than just what happens on Sundays. And so uh, especially later this summer and into the fall, we'll start launching groups in people's homes that will meet and commit to be the church together in smaller groups as we continue to, to meet all together on Sunday in larger groups. And so we're laying the, the groundwork for what we're praying the Lord will do. And uh, so last week we started this series called Faithful Presence in Prayer. Like as I think about the foundation of this church, one of the things that I hope becomes truer and truer is that we are a praying people. That, that we're a people who, who say without the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, we're, we're not going to move. Like we need God to show up. We need God to answer. We want to we plead with God to do things. And so we're just spending time diving into the Lord's Prayer from, uh, from Matthew. Um, Jesus's disciples went to Jesus and they said, hey, would you teach us to pray? Um, the reality of being a praying church is admitting that prayer is difficult, that it's that it's not easy. And so Jesus's disciples were in the same boat and they said, hey, will you teach us to pray? Um, they, they asked us. And so last week we saw our, our approach in prayer that Jesus actually tells us, hey, pray to God as father. That, that, that really was the thing that got Jesus crucified, is that he was claiming to be God himself, and he was telling people to refer to God as Father. Uh, we saw last week that, that our, our kind of foundational prayer is our Father, and we're asking God, uh, hallowed be your name. You know, with the Lord's Prayer, one of the reasons we're spending multiple weeks in this is it's something that a lot of us, even if you didn't grow up in the church, we're pretty familiar with the Lord's Prayer. And I think in general don't really know what it means. Like, hallowed be your name. Uh, most people, I don't think, speak that way. We say, hey, I, you know, babe, I love you. I, I want you to be hallowed. You know, well, what does that mean? And give us this day our daily bread. You're like, well, I, what if I'm keto? I don't, I don't, my daily bread, I, I don't, I don't know what to do about that, right? So, I don't know where that came from. Okay, so, when we pray, hallowed be your name, we're, we're saying, God, I want your name to be valued. We're saying, I want your name to be held up as holy. I want people to see you as you are. I, I want other people to respect, honor, love, cherish, and worship you as you are. We're saying, when we say, Father, hallowed be your name, we're saying, Would, God, I want that to happen in my own life and in the lives of others as well. And then this week, we're going to dive into the next petition, the next request of this prayer. Jesus says in Matthew 6.10, you heard it earlier. He says, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we need to ask, like, what's going on here? When Jesus says, pray like this, 
And he includes this request, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's really important. For him to put this here in this prayer, that means it's really important. And we need to know, like, what's he getting after when he tells us, when you pray, pray kingdom prayers like this. God, your kingdom come, your will be done. We need to understand what he's talking about. So let's ask the question, what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God that we're asking for him to bring? Jesus, actually, his first recorded words in the gospel of Mark are, are these in Mark 1.15. Jesus says that time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The, the first recorded words of Jesus in the gospel of Mark are about the kingdom. He talks a whole lot about the kingdom. Uh, when you think kingdom, uh, what you ought to be thinking is for there to be a kingdom, there needs to be a king. There needs to be rule and there needs to be territory, right? A king ruling, it's not really a kingdom if there's not a king. And if there's no territory, that's not a very impressive king, right? He's got to have a land to rule. Graham Goldsworthy, uh, an excellent theologian, says the kingdom of God is God's people in God's place enjoying God's rule. As simply as he can put it, and I think that's so helpful, the kingdom of God is God's people in God's place enjoying God's rule. This is actually what the entire Bible is about. Like the arc of the entire scripture is around that reality, God's people in God's place enjoying God's rule. So think all the way back to creation, Genesis 1 and 2. What do you have? God, out of the overflow of the love that he experiences in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he creates. He creates this perfect world, and then he creates man and woman, Genesis 1, to reflect his glory, to, to image who he is. So what you see in the Garden of Eden in a really beautiful way is God's people, Adam and Eve during this time, in God's place, the Garden of Eden, this unique, beautiful place that he had created, enjoying God's rule. Uh, the Bible says in Genesis 1 and 2 that Adam walked with God, that he actually experienced this unique and beautiful relationship with God. That was God's kingdom in Eden. God's people, God's place, God's rule. That place was perfect. That's what God intends for his kingdom to be. Perfect place, no death, no disease, no decay, no broken relationships, no fractured marriages, no kids who don't have a dad, who don't have a mom, everything perfect. What we see in Genesis 3 is that God has an enemy who comes and he is intent on destroying God's people, God's place, and God's rule. So he comes in and he says to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, hey, I think God's holding out on you. I think God's kingdom is one where he's, he's abusing you with his authority. He's, he's not letting you have all that you, all that you could have. There was one tree that he told him, don't eat from that tree. Everything else is yours. Enjoy, enjoy my place uh, as my people. And uh, what, we, what we know is in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve rebel against God. They choose their own way rather than God's way. And essentially, them saying, we're going to eat from this tree that God told us not to. Then we're going to run and hide from God is them saying, we want our own kingdom. We want to live under our own rule. And so we're rejecting God, your kingdom and your rule. We no longer want to be your people. <coughs> what happens is that breaks everything. The fall of Genesis 3 fractures everything. And so you no longer have God's place. God kicks them out of the Garden of Eden. They're no longer God's people. Where there once was relationship, there's now separation between them and God. They're no longer enjoying God's rule. Sin, death, and decay comes in. Not only do we experience this as the people of God, like that's the reality that we're all living in. We're not under God's rule the way that we're intended to be. We're not God's people the way that we're intended to be. We're not in God's place. Like, this is nothing like what he intended creation to be like. Creation itself is fractured as well. Everything around us is dying. It's not representative of the kingdom that God came to create. There's also this whisper of hope in Genesis 3. And the reason I'm spending so much time here is I want you to see that all of Scripture, like, if we're going to be a Bible-focused people— all of scripture has a kingdom arc to it. It's God returning us to Eden through the person and work of Jesus. 
So there's this whisper in Genesis 3 that there's going to come a rescuer, that the death and decay that came through Adam and Eve's rebellion, through their rejection of the kingdom of God, the decay that came from that, something was going to happen that's going to reverse that. And God's going to make this place his perfect kingdom again. The rest of the Old Testament is God preparing the way for Christ to come and reverse the curse. The whole rest, I mean, from Genesis 3 on until we see Christ is God preparing the, the, the time and the people and the places for Christ to come. And then Jesus himself comes, and like we heard in, in Mark 1, he says, the kingdom of God is, is near, it's at hand, some of your translations say. Unlike the first Adam, Jesus doesn't submit to the whispers of the enemy. G, uh, the, the, the Satan comes to Jesus just like he did to Adam and Eve and says to Jesus, hey, establish your own kingdom right now. Do it right now. Do it in your own way. And Jesus, unlike an Adam and Eve, rejects the lives of the enemy. He says, hey, no, I'm here to do my father's work. Jesus lives a perfect life. He suffers the punishment for our sins that we were meant to. And Jesus goes to the cross and he actually experiences separation that we were meant to experience. And he does it in our place all to bring us back to the Father. He doesn't just die for us. He raises for us in victory. And then Jesus leaves us with this promise. He says, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. This kingdom that he kicked off, that he inaugurated at his first coming, he will fully culminate at his second coming. It'll be God's people in God's place enjoying God's rule. That's the arc of all of scripture. There's a rebellion in the garden that is one day leading to a beautiful reconciliation and redemption in the garden again at the end of Revelation when God has made all things new through Jesus. But we're left in this tension Right? We're left in the tension of Jesus has inaugurated a kingdom that he's not fully culminated. Another way to say that is when we think of the kingdom of God, we're in this already not yet. That's what a lot of theologians have called it. That Jesus has come to reverse the curse. That through faith in what Jesus has done in your place, you can be brought into the family of God as a child. You can be brought into the kingdom of God. He's come to set things right between man and God. Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom. You know, you heard in Mark 1, he says, repent. The kingdom of God is, is near. It's at hand. And then as he leaves and he gives the church the message to continue to advance the gospel, we see in Ephesians 3 that actually it's through the church. This is why we care so much about church planting, not just here, but in places like Iraq and Yemen and Syria in Turkey, we care because we believe Ephesians 3, like Paul says, that the manifold, manifold wisdom of God is being made known through the church that Jesus promised he will build. Jesus gives us in Matthew 13 this illustration of what the kingdom of God is like. It's like a mustard seed. And the mustard seed is really small and significant. That's how it starts. And then it grows into this massive thing. He says that's what the kingdom of God is like. It started in this small, insignificant way, and it's continuing to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. The kingdom is here, but it's not fully here. That's the not yet part of the kingdom of God, because there's still death. There's still suffering. There's still pain. When Jesus says, hey, pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it, as it is in heaven. God's will isn't being perfectly done here like it is in heaven. We're not experiencing that reality in fullness. Hebrews 2, 8 and 9 says, For in subjecting everything to him, to Jesus, he, God, left nothing that is not subject to him. Jesus reigns and rules over all things. There's a theologian who said there, there's not a square inch of all creation that Jesus doesn't stand over and say, Mine. Hebrews continues on and says, as it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him. That's the not yet of the kingdom. We don't see that fully. We don't experience it fully. But we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace, he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. He has come and he will come again. That's what we as the people of God believe. That's the kingdom. Jesus inaugurated it, 
The kingdom of God is at hand, and he will one day culminate it. It will be fully here. There will be no more not yet. It will just be here. Already not yet will be a phrase we used to talk about that one time. And it'll be fully here. That's the kingdom we want. That's the kingdom we long for. But we've got to admit, we don't experience it fully, which is why Jesus would say, when you pray, pray like this. God, your kingdom come. We long for that kingdom. But we know things are bad. <clears throat> things are not good. Right? Regardless of, of who you are, I, I think you've thought this. You, you may not have prayed it, God, your kingdom come. But you've certainly felt it. As you look around, you're like, this is not how it feels like things should be. There should not be kids who go without parents. There should not be parents who abuse their kids. There should not. I, I opened the news this morning. Uh, it's an interesting thing to do. I wouldn't recommend it a whole lot. <laughs> just the front page of the news. Here's just some. I'm not even going to talk about what these news articles were. Here's just some of the, the, the headlines. Truck plowed into a parade. One person dead. Newsom assaulted by aggressive homeless on Oakland Street. Taser-wielding madman sparks mayhem in New York City Park. Good gracious. Washington Square becomes no-go zone after dark. Hardline judiciary head wins presidency in Iran. Some, like next line, he had pregnant women tortured. The first dog is dead. Joe Biden, sorry, you can laugh. I don't know, maybe we shouldn't laugh. Probably we shouldn't laugh. Uh, I just, it was interesting that that was a very prominent headline that the first dog is dead. So you can mourn that. Woman claims she's in love with alien after UFO abduction. <laughs> I, like, <laughs> like all those headlines, be them a little humorous or just completely sad, they show us that we are not experiencing the kingdom of God in the full reality that Adam and Eve would in the Garden of Eden. Those are just the news headlines. Think about your own life. What's going on in your life? I, I would guess that there are things going on in your physical body. There are things going on in your relationships. There are things going on uh, all around you that you would say, in my life I'm not experiencing the full reality of the kingdom of God. This is why Jesus says that we pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what does the kingdom we're asking for look like? So I think as we think of the kingdom of God, we want all the murderers, we want the abusers, we want the unjust, uh, unjust people, we want them out of the kingdom of God. That's the problem with the world that we see. Well, Jesus actually shows us what the kingdom of God looks like in the Sermon on the Mount. He says in Matthew 5.21, you've heard it say that you shouldn't commit murder, but I say to you, anyone who's been angry with their brother and their heart has committed murder is guilty. So he says, hey, the kingdom of God is a place where that doesn't happen. What he's saying is, who's in and who's not? If you've ever been angry with somebody, you're not. <clears throat> Matthew 5, 27, he says, hey, you, you've heard it said that you shouldn't commit adultery. But I say to you, every man or woman who looks at another man or woman with lustful intent in their heart, they've committed adultery. They're guilty under the law. Matthew 5, 31, Jesus says, hey, you, you've heard it said if you want a divorce, you just give your spouse a certificate of divorce. But Jesus actually says everyone who divorces his wife, except in a case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Jesus starts to lump in those who don't belong in the kingdom of God. And as he goes through this list, we ought to all be saying, uh-oh. We would categorize people like, well, the abusers, the murderers, those who are unjust, they don't deserve to be in the kingdom of God that I deserve to be in. And Jesus is going to say, let me actually go for your heart. This is in Matthew 5.38. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, turn the other cheek. Uh-oh. Matthew 5.43 says to love your enemies. 
That's what the kingdom of God looks like. Matthew 6.25, he says, don't be anxious about anything. He has a whole lot to say about money. It's really easy for us to look at other people and say they should be out of the kingdom of God. They're ruining it. That's why we have the not yet, because people like that are still around. The problem is, you and I should be out. We should be over here. And something happens with Jesus where he takes us from this group over here and brings us into the kingdom of God. We don't belong in this kingdom. So when Jesus says, hey, your kingdom come, your will be done, we ought to feel, I don't belong in that kingdom. I've not done anything to deserve entrance in the, into the kingdom that I'm praying would be brought. Romans 3, uh, Paul quotes from Psalm 14 and says, as it is written, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All, uh, and in the Greek, all means all, actually. <laughs> all have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There's no one who does what is good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is under their lips. He's including himself in this. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths. In the path of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God in their eyes. What I want you to see is that we are praying for a kingdom to come that we don't belong in. We don't deserve to be in that kingdom. We long for a kingdom that we have no right actually being in. All, not some. When Jesus was asked about the kingdom of God, he didn't say, these are the, like the white list of sins. These ones are the like, you know, the gray list. We can kind of, I don't know, they're not that bad. These ones over here are really bad. He says, no, no, no. Everyone, everyone falls short. But God. Um, I've always thought it'd be really interesting to do a sermon series of all the time scripture says, but God. Paul says in Ephesians 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in, in, in which we all once walked, following the prince of the power of darkness. But God being rich in mercy. But God, Jesus actually comes to bring us home. That's the good news of the gospel. When Jesus says, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. It's repent and believe the reality that God is reestablishing his kingdom. And he's not telling you all the things you need to do to earn entrance into this kingdom. He's saying you don't deserve to be in this kingdom because you're in the kingdom of darkness. I'm going to bring you into the kingdom of light. That's the good news of the gospel. Romans 5 verse 6. While we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's all of us. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We do not make ourselves worthy of the kingdom of God. So when we as a people are going into a lost and hurting world, we're not going saying, we've got the list of things you need to do so that at the end of your life, it's 51% good and 49 bad. It weighs itself out. Now you're brought into the family of God. We go out saying, come to Jesus. There is one who has purchased your right to be in the kingdom of God through his life and death in your place. We don't fight our way in. We don't earn our way in. God takes us through no merit of our own, through no effort of our own, God takes us from one kingdom and transfers us to another. This is what Paul says in Colossians 1. Jesus has rescued us from the domain of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In him, in Jesus, we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. John says in 1 John 4, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The amazing thing about Jesus snatching us out of one kingdom and bringing us into another kingdom 
is that he doesn't bring us in as subjects. Like when you think kingdom, often you think I'm, I'm brought in as one who's out in the fields and does all the work and does everything. He doesn't bring us in as subjects. He actually brings us in as sons and daughters, which is why Jesus says when he's teaching us to pray this, that we pray not even to him as king. We pray to God as father, as dearly loved sons and daughters who say our father we're adopted into the family of God, and as the family of God, we pray this, your kingdom come. Jesus brings us home. Yes. So let's just end by saying, well, how do, we, how do we pray this? What does it look like for us to pray this type of prayer? Well, it starts with us. So often when we pray, we're thinking about all those, all those who are over in this camp, in this category. God, I want you to show up. I want you to show them how wicked they are and how wrong they are. And God, I want you to show up in these other churches. We always start with them. Praying your kingdom come actually starts with us. We're saying, God, your kingdom come, your will be done in my own life. I want more and more of my life brought under your rule and reign, Jesus. I want to experience more of your reign in my life. We're saying not that your kingdom would just come out there, but that your kingdom would come in here. Because there's dark corners of your heart that you're not experiencing under the authority of Jesus. You've not brought into the light. That there's ways that you, just like me, are living like we're part of a different kingdom. It starts with us. And then as we pray for others, we're saying, God, I, I want others to experience this reality. Saying, God, your kingdom come in the heart of my family, my friends, my neighborhood, the people I work with who are far from you. I, I want them to see and experience that they're offered adoption into this kingdom. That, that they can have the king himself as an older brother and God himself as a good father, as sons and daughters. That's what we're saying. So when we pray prayers like this, your kingdom come. We're saying, God, I want people who are far from you to experience the reality of this kingdom and would you do that um uh, my i'll put my daughter on the spot i love you sweetheart uh my daughter audra kate she we've got this neighbor named leonard who's uh he's great and uh super kind and Audra is a little evangelist at heart. And uh, she was over there hanging out with Mr. Leonard while he was doing yard work. And um, she's, you know, I, I'll probably get it wrong, Audra. I'm sorry. You can take the mic next week and tell us exactly what happened. But she's like, hey, Mr. Leonard, do you know Jesus? And we're like, well, you know, he's dancing around. Well, you know, I don't really do that. I don't, you know. She's like, you, you have to know Jesus or you'll go to hell. You know, it's like, a, okay. All right, we're working on a more robust message of salvation than what Jesus has done. But, like, that's the incredible reality. Like, she wants the kingdom of God to come in Mr. Leonard's life like it has in ours. Like, that's some of what Jesus is after, I think, by the way, when he says, like, hey, come after me like a, like a child would. Have childlike faith. We want others to experience this. Praying kingdom prayers like this, kingdom of God prayers, means that we, we see people in a different light. We don't stand over here and say, hey, as soon as you get this area of your life taken care of, then you can come with me. We say Jesus has actually come to bring life and light where there's darkness. Yes. There's another kingdom he want to trans wants to transfer you into. And we're also praying when we say your kingdom come, we're praying that Jesus would return and make all things new like he promised. That the kingdom he inaugurated would be culminated that pain would be no more, that tears would be wiped away, that suffering would be done away with, that death itself would be put to death. That's what we're praying.